Today we're going to be reading chapter two from A Killer Plot by Ellery Adams. Now this is the first in a series called Books by the Bay Mystery and chapter one was already read by Courtney so I will leave a link to her chapter below and now we're ready to read chapter two but if you just jumped in two things. Um, I'm Lisa and welcome to my cozy mystery author tube channel. And the second thing is this is the November book of the month for the Cozy Escape book club. So the Cozy Escape book club is free to join and it's really just a bunch of people who love reading and talking about cozy mysteries. So we pick a new book every month and when I say we, you actually get to vote and help us pick out the book. So we go with whatever everybody in the group wants to read each month and everyone chose a killer plot. Now we do have different themes for each season and this was this is the last month of the bookish themes for cozy mysteries and next month we start moving into culinary cozies that's not even true baking cozies specifically and that will be December, January, and February. So if you're not a member make sure to join because it's fun. I have a link below and if you have never read Ellery Adams either have I. A couple things to note uh, just to recap quickly chapter one. The first thing is this book is I believe chapter one was written in omniscient point of view which means it's like uh, the eye in the sky, like a super being that knows everything that's going on in the story, both past, present, and future. And also it is a, it's set in everyday modern times and in a small town. Now, so far in chapter one, I have to say I'm not too much of it. It's not really like my kind of story. Uh, there's lots of gossiping. There's women that hate other women. Uh, there is slut shaming. And there's also the main character so far, Olivia, who's the rich woman in town. There was another romance author at another table that was reading her book, I guess in a critique circle, and Olivia loudly made fun of her and all of the romance things in there. So as a romance author, I guess I wasn't too excited about reading about that. Uh, and just in general, yeah. So I'm still open, willing to give it a chance. So let's just go ahead and read on. So chapter two has a quote at the top from Ernest Hemingway, which says, Always do sober what you said you'd do drunk. That will teach you to keep your mouth shut. So I guess that's a word of warning. <laughs> Olivia, who's the rich person in town, turned the skeleton tea in the door and paused. After so much time, she wondered what sights awaited her within the lighthouse keeper's cottage, the home of her childhood. 30 years had passed since grandmother Limoges had descended on Oyster Bay, swooped up her only grandchild and installed her in one of the country's most elite, all girl boarding schools. I guess we're obviously talking about her, <laughs> Olivia. Uh, before then, she had been an unheeded and unhindered 10 year old girl named Libby, a girl raised by her fisherman father on the girl on the or the girl who raised herself as some of the townsfolk whispered. Twisting the key farther, Livia heard the click of the lock releasing. As she eased the door open, she half expected a rush of whiskey-tinged air and lost dreams to burst out through the crack and knock her to the ground, but only a wisp of decay escaped from within. Come along, Havilin, Olivia whispered, irritated by the hush in her voice. Run ahead and make sure there are no vermin waiting to scurry across my feet. Pleased to obey, the poodle rushed into the house. Barking a warning to any rodents or insects that would certainly have grown bold enough to claim proprietorship over the abandoned cottage. Dust. Olivia walked over a solid film of the stuff formed by layer upon layer of dirt, mold, spider webs, and time. Glad she had had the foresight to don her rubber boots before entering the house. She shook several steps into the hall and turned right into the living room. Olivia surveyed the room quickly, trying to keep the memories of moments spent in this space at bay. Her attempts were futile, of course, and the dark gloom seeped into her being and reduced her to the motherless child who spent her days in solitude, battling feelings, perpetual trepidation, and oppressive isolation. This does sound a little bit like literary fiction. <laughs> um, there was not enough natural light to banish the shadows. It took the full measure of Olivia's arrested will to wrench the faded plaid curtains right off the rods. They pulled on the floor in clouds of dust, allowing the sun to illuminate the blood red walls, the faded green fabric on the drooping sofa, the broken rung on the wooden ladder back chair that had once been Olivia's assigned seat and her father's prized collection of maritime art. How I hated these, she told Haviland, yet she couldn't refrain from re-examining the paintings. These were not scenes of pleasure cruises on flat cerulean waters, 
but schooners with rent sails or shabby fishing trawlers being tossed about in angry oceans of black waves. An element of violence permeated each picture. Even in the few paintings depicting calm skies and still seas, the hint of a dorsal fin or a low bank of menacing thunderclouds implied imminent danger. I hate them still, she murmured. Olivia returned to the central hallway, the floorboards groaning as she stepped on their warped wood. The door to the back bedroom was closed, and Olivia paused with her hand in the knob. She buried her girlhood history beneath layers of travel education, a razor-sharp business acumen, and by keeping her relationships casual. A few weeks of dinners in five-star restaurants, an opera, or a play, perhaps an art gallery opening, and then eventually sex. But as soon as the man indicated an interest in taking things to the next level by producing a family member for Olivia to meet or a request that they spend the night at her place instead of his, she'd break off the relationship with the swift defi- definiteness of an executioner. Thus, unwounded and thoroughly in control, Olivia would retreat to familiar solitude. That won't work in this town, she thought as she stared at the shut door. door. They already know my secret, so I'm vulnerable here, she sighed. If I truly return to exhume the past, scatter it like ashes, and get beyond chapter five once and for all, I must start with this room. Another breath of imprisoned air swirled around her knees as she entered her old room. With one glance, it would have been obvious to the most witless bystander that this space belonged to a neglected child. There was a cot pushed against the far wall, the kind of cot that folds in half and can be stored in a closet that squeaks each time one shifts during sleep and has problem springs to dig into one's back and prevent sweet dreams from ever approaching too near. There was a comforter stained by mildew, a circle of black mold on the ceiling above the bed, and a lamp stock filled with cracked light bulb, with a cracked light bulb positioned on top of an overturned wooden crate. A three-tiered, by the way, I just want to say, like, if this woman is the richest woman in town, I don't understand why she doesn't just hire someone to clean the place for her. Or maybe just hire her driver. Like, she parked at the handicap spot at the restaurant. So I don't feel like that was a nice thing to do either. Like, what if there was really a handicapped person that needed that spot? (laughs) All right. A three-tiered bookshelf near the door held an assortment of wrecked books. They were used to begin with, bought at library sales or from Goodwill, and reread so often that the pages were as supple as tissue paper. Below the single window, covered by an old crib sheet embellished by faded yellowed mermaids, was a dollhouse. Olivia and her mother had built the dollhouse from a kit bought at the Five and Dime. During a rainy spring week, they glued, painted, and decorated the diminutive Victorian mansion. Now its royal purple clapboard and average ivory gingerbread had faded to a sickly lavender and brown. Easing the front door open, Olivia was unsurprised to find the interior riddled with spider webs and carcasses of moths and beetles. The doll family had long since been removed from the house and all the furniture was gone save for a four poster bed and a clawfoot bathtub. Are you like, do you feel like, I feel like bugs or spiders are on me now just thinking about this space. All right, please be here, Eliz- Olivia whispered hopefully and then stuck her finger into the oversized fireplace located in the formal front parlor. She grasped a faux brass andaron. I don't actually know what that is. I'm going to have to look that up. (laughs) And pulled the motion as familiar to her as though she'd repeated it yesterday. The entire fireplace came away in her hand, revealing a small hidden cavity. Inside, there was a square of wax paper, which Olivia unfolded in hurried movements. Holding the treasure to the dust-filled light, she sighed with relief. Her eyes ran over the contours of the gold starfish pendant while her fingertips unclasped the fine gold chain. She bent her head, enjoying the feel of the cool gold against the back of her neck and the weight of the starfish as it nestled into the soft depression of flesh between her collarbones. Mother. She closed her eyes and cried silently for a little while. The dull ache in her heart throbbed to life and the image of her mother, tan, freckled, and laughing as she leapt through a fan of sprinkler water, appeared before Olivia's eyes. It was one of the last times they'd been together, and Olivia remembered the ghost of a rainbow simmering in the water's mist, her mother's long legs severing the covers, severing the colors, severing the colors, only discover they'd reformed instantaneously in her wake. Olivia stood, thinking that her few precious memories of her mother were as ephemeral as that summer rainbow. Wiping her eyes, she brushed off the dirt clinging to her knees and pulled out her cell phone. Enough, she declared as she began to punch in numbers. Hopefully she's calling for someone to help and finish doing this work for her. That woman in the food market was right, she thought. The people of Oyster Bay saved my life. They found me on that boat and cared for me until grandmother came. Revitalizing abandoned buildings, hiring the job list, and opening the finest restaurant this place has ever seen has made me wealthier, but I've done nothing selfless to repay that debt. She listened to the cell phone ring. Oyster Bay can have this house as soon as I have expunged its history. 
A man's voice burst a greeting through her phone speaker, and she walked out of her little bedroom without looking back, the only treasure left with its confines now safely hidden beneath her shirt. Clive? It's Olivia. Listen, I'd like you to haul your work on the King Street building for a moment. Something more pressing has come up. Can you meet me at the lighthouse keeper's cottage right away? She paused, listening to me ask what she had in mind. A total overhaul. New roof, siding, plumbing, flooring, you name it. And Clive, she walked, to the, uh, she walked out of the house and didn't bother to shut the door. I need it fast. Hooray. Someone else will come and do the work. All right. Several weeks later, she called Camden Fort. Wow, we have just jumped in time like a month. Um, and offered the Bayside book writers the use of the banquet room of her restaurant, the Boot, Tap, the Boot Top Bistro. Just this once, she informed him firmly. By your next visit, I'll have arranged for a more permanent gathering place. Splendid, Camden Gush. And will your supple slave girl be making her debut at our meeting? Camilla, queen of the harem, ruler of Pharaoh's ruler? He chuckled wickedly. I don't know if that's how you say it, but the spelling in here for Camilla is the same as my friend Camilla, who's Polish. Usually I see it spelled with the C A M I L L A, like Camilla. So that was interesting. I guess Camilla is a part of Egyptian history, maybe? Anyways, Olivia smiled with the other under the phone. Ever since she put on her mother's necklace and awoke each morning to the sounds of hammering nail guns, shouting, swearing, and salsa music coming from the crew working on the lighthouse. Keeper's Cottage, she felt lighter in spirit than she had in years, but there were limits to how much change she could handle at once. I think I'll stick to eavesdropping, she replied, though part of her longed to take a risk and open her work up to criticism. I'm not quite ready to commit. I suspect you've had that phrase many times in your life, Camden commented without judgment. Darling, life is messy, but sometimes it's fun to get a little dirty. Spread your wings, jump off the diving board, make mud pies. I'll keep going with these cliches until you agree. Save them for your book, Olivia parried, parried playfully, and then change the subject. What about food? Oh, whip us out some tapas type tidbits, Camden ordered casually. I'll treat this time since we'll be celebrating our freedom from all things Andrew Lloyd Webber. They discussed the meeting time and then said goodbye, but not before Camden threatened to call Fedor's and AAA and complained about cutting his tongue on a shard of shell found in the boot tops clam chowder if Olivia didn't agree to become a member of the Bayside Book Writers. Olivia hissed, you wouldn't. I won't because you're going to be at the meeting. I won't make you read this time, but consider it your only reprieve. Olivia heard the smile in Camden's voice. I told you, my blonde Amazon, we need one another. Feeling momentarily expansive, Olivia answered, I'm being forced against my will. As I'm being forced against my will, then I might as well see to the drinks. I can't see through any more heaving bosoms without bourbon. I don't know why we have to make fun of romance books. But anyways, <laughs> and I don't know why you'd invite somebody who's so mean with criticism to the writer's group. <laughs> but I guess since she owns everything in town, you might as well. Purely medis medicinal, Camden agreed readily and hung up. A few evenings later, so now we've moved ahead in time, it sounds like a week, Olivia realized that the food she had chosen to serve the writers was completely wrong. Michael, her chef, had outdone himself in producing a selection of succulent hors d'oeuvres when a waiter had delivered the polished silver trays laden with black truffle canopies, smoking salmon, roulades, prosciutto and gruyere, pinwheels, shrimp wontons, and lamb meatballs in a pinot noir sauce. Olivia had been pleased with the artistic arrangement of the Epicurean fare, but for a reason she could not fathom the food had barely been touched by the author hopefuls gathered in the private banquet room. Should I have served beer instead of wine? Olivia second-guessed her decision to decant two bottles of Meritage. Were the vintages too cigar box to the taste, too fruity or overly hefty for her guest's palates? They'd barely sip from their Rydell tumblers. I guess Rydell must be a brand. I'm actually not familiar with it. Um, Olivia's hands itched to be wrapped around a glass filled with half a finger's worth of 25-year-old Chivas Regal, her customary evening intoxicant. Having become rather immune to the comfort or contentment of other people, unless they were patrons of the boot top, Olivia found her desire to gratify these strangers unsettling. I should have ordered dominoes and served wine in the box, she thought, growing more irritated by the moment. The silence in the room was cloying, and she distracted herself by fiddling with the floral centerpiece. That done, she checked her watch again. Where the hell is Ford? I suppose we should tell you who we are, the husky, melodious voice emanated from the exotic part Asian beauty whose black hair was now pink striped. Her dark brows were pierced with rows of silver hoops, and she wore a diamond nose stud. She was attired in a short plaid shirt, a faded Hello Kitty shirt, a black and black leather boots. Name's Malay Hallowell, 24 years old, art, artist and bartender. I'm writing a young adult fantasy novel, you know, the spicy kind where a bunch of sheltered virgins get raped by satyrs and stuff. Did I hear someone mention being ravaged by goat boys? Camden Ford inquired as he breezed into the room. How delicious. A fair blush tinged Malay's cheeks as she crossed her arms over her chest and tried to look tough. 
Doing introductions, are we? Excellent. Who's next? Camden gestured at the young man resembling Peter Pan. Um, he looked at Olivia as his fingers mangled a Gruyere pinwheel. I'm Harris Williams. He pushed a wave of soft hair from his forehead. I'm into computers. I create graphics for fantasy games. I've got the best job in the world, flexible hours, a good salary, and I have a lot in common with my coworkers. We're all pretty smart, but we don't have the greatest people skills. Imagine that, Camden teased. Go on, man, before the food gets cold. Sorry, um, I'm a science guy. My book's about the imminent destruction of planet Zultan. A group of 100 Zultans have been chosen to start a new colony on the planet Remus. Their leader is a warrior princess named Zenobia. Noticing the confused looks of his audience, Harris hurriedly concluded, anyway, a spacecraft carrying the convicts destined for a life sentence is hardly where crash lands on Sultan, and these guys kill a bunch of the chosen ones, Zenobia, and one of the criminals. Very Flash Gordon, isn't it? Camden arched an eyebrow for Olivia's benefit and then directed his attention to a flustered woman in her early 30s. And you've already had the pleasure of listen listening to some of Laurel's work. Give Olivia the 411 and your exciting life, my dear. The woman giggled. I don't know about exciting, but my name's Laura Hobbs. I'm a stay-at-home mom with twin boys, Dallas and Dermot. They're 27 months and real handful. You've probably heard us in the grocery store. Even her laugh, high and melodious, was lovely. I try to write when they're napping, but it's hard to find the time with laundry and making dinner and all the errands. The twins are at such a demanding age, but I think they're very naughty because they're so smart. Would you like to see a picture of them? She asked Olivia and began fumbling beneath her chair. I have a whole bunch in my purse. Olivia stared at her in horror. Camden quickly intervened when Laura could locate her purse. Tell our hostess about your writing, darling. Laurel blinked. Oh, right, she exclaimed with another nervous giggle. My dream is to write romance novels like Nora Roberts or Daniel Still. I want to write books like theirs. I've wanted to write books like theirs ever since I read my first romance book in high school. That sounds lovely. Um, Camden smiled benevolently. I added that. <laughs> it sounds lovely. It's not written in the book. Um, Camden smiled benevolently at Laurel and then gestured to Olivia. You're at bat. Swing away. Olivia smooths at the tablecloth. She never told anyone but Dixie about her novel, and she wondered what the others would think of her storyline. Taking a deep breath, she tersely explained, My manuscript in progress is a work of historical fiction. It's set in ancient Egypt and focuses on the struggles of a young concubine in the household of Ramses the Great. The little slut Camden poured himself a glass of wine. Your Egyptian vixen would fit right in with the troupe of thinly veiled fictional celebrities. Yes, indeed. I know the real man my hero is based on well enough to be certain he would simply salivate over a piece of tan jail bait wearing a transparent linen shift. Laurel gazed at the gossip writer in adoration. I still can't believe you're friends with famous people. Can't inflict his wrist at her. Please, we are not friends. I know more big names than you could fit in this lovely, very feng shui, but don't be impressed, my dear. Most celebrities are vain, vapid, and filled with vice. He plucked a shrimp wonton from the tray and place, placed it in delicately in the center of a cocktail napkin. Did you catch my alliteration there, my dears? Now, Olivia, tell us about you. Please help yourselves. Olivia pointed to a dictatorial finger at pointed a dictatorial finger at the food trays. She waited until the writers focused on refilling their plates and then said, I'm Olivia Limoges. I live out on the point with my standard poodle, Captain Haviland. He's sleeping in my office at the moment, she added when Laurel appeared under the tablecloth. I'm unmarried and childless and plan to stay that way. Now that now that this place, she gesticulated around the room, and my rental properties are up and running, I'd like to proceed with my writing. She crossed her arms and looked at Ford. Could you tell me more about the group schedule and assignments? Excellent canopies, my dear. Camden saluted her with his refreshed wine glass. Thus far, we've congregated every other week, but we've all decided to meet weekly in order to make more progress. And we each take turns having our work reviewed. Soon enough, it'll be your turn to bring us copies of your manuscript, Olivia. He picked up a stack of papers on an end table. Lucky for you, I brought my pages tonight so you can take out all of your aggressions on my humble prose. He grinned at her. This gives you an entire week to sharpen your pencil, my dear. Don't worry, I take criticisms very well. Olivia sniffed. Oh, but don't worry. We're not really mean to each other. Laurel had misinterpreted the noise as anxiety. We say a lot of nice things, too. I mean, honestly, the only person who said anything mean so far has been Olivia. <laughs> um, Malay rolled her eyes. And that's a waste of time, if you ask me. We'll never get better if we just sit around blowing smoke up each other's asses. When it's my turn, be as harsh as you want. She pointed a slim finger at Olivia. Bring it, sister. Harris, who had been stealing glances at Malay all evening, dusted the crumbs from a prosciutto and gruyere pinwheel off his long-fingered hands and reached into a plastic bag resting next to his feet. I had this cool English teacher in high school who never used a red pen. She said the color made students feel like they had written something wrong when her main intent was to help give us helpful suggestions. She wrote comments using greening. So I brought green pens for all of us. May we do no harm. He leapt out of his chair and promptly handed out packets containing two green ballpoint pens to his fellow writers. I think that's cute. I've actually never heard of that. Um, all right. Thank you, Harris. You were so sweet, Laurel. Uh, 
emitted a vibe of maternal approvement. I'd much rather be criticized in green than in red. I always dress my son Dermot in green. Dallas wears blue a lot. I'm afraid red would get them even more worked up than usual. It's such an emerge energizing color. Why, we were practically banned from story time at the library after the day I dressed them both in red overalls. After accepting Harris's gift, Camden passed out copies of his chapter for review. Now I'm going to break protocol and refuse to read aloud tonight. Olivia here has an announcement to make, and after she does, we're relocating to the bar to celebrate. No work this evening, my darlings. Tonight, we make merry. All eyes turned to Olivia. Yes, well, you all know where the lighthouse is, correct? Out on the point, she added for Camden's sake. The cottage is on my family's, and I mean my land, and... It's currently being restored. It won't be totally ready for another week or so, but we can hold our future meetings there at no charge, of course. Camden led the group in a round of delighted surprise, and as the writers thanked Olivia, she waved them off. Warmed and slightly embarrassed by their gratitude, she suggested they follow her to the bar. See, you're not quite the wicked witch of the South, Camden whispered in her ear. Good evening, Gabe. Olivia ignored Camden and focused on the boot top's handsome bartender instead. These folks are my friends. How odd to be calling them that, she thought. Please be certain to put their drinks on my tab. The bartender, a young man in his late 20s with a deep tan and attractive all-American face, nodded in acquiescence after serving Laurel in Manhattan. Gabe poured a generous amount of Chivas Regal over a, I don't even know if I'm saying that, Chivas Regal, Chivas Regal, over a few asymmetrical blocks of hand-chiseled ice and set the tumbler down in front of his employer. Originally positioned at the far end of the bar, Malay slid away from Harris and jumped onto the stool next to Olivia I didn't expect this place to be so hip, she commented, taking a slurp of beer. Olivia bristled. Why not? Because I'm so advanced in years? Huh? Malay missed the note of sarcasm. It's just that my parents love coming here. It's where they go for their special occasions, you know. She gestured around the wood panel bar. They both teach at the community college and can only afford a place like this once in a while. After seeing what you charge for beer, I can see why. The year-rounders in Oyster Bay aren't exactly loaded. How do you stay in business? Pleased to note that the restaurant was nearly full, full Olivia took Malay's question seriously. There are quite a few tourists here tonight. We're always busy from May to October, especially since the famous article about Oyster Bay's appeal appeared in time. In the winter, things will slow down, but as you said, people come here for birthdays and anniversaries and such. We also host Christmas parties and many local businesses, uh, and we cater. I think this is a long chapter. I don't know why I get long chapters all the time. All right, we still have 10 more pages. <laughs> um, all right, she looked around and gazed at the ochre alls. Ocher, oh, I don't know how to say that. Ochre alls, which were covered by enormous paintings of wine bottles as the pristine white cloths, at the pristine white cloths, and terracotta hued napkins, napkin fans on the few unoccupied tables. Votive candles shone through the cylinders of dark amber cut glass made in Indonesia. The same shade of amber formed a thick stripe of paint on the walls and seemed to be subtle to subtly box in the diners, creating an atmosphere of warm elegance with a hint of exclusivity. Interesting, Malay replied, and Olivia couldn't tell whether she was sincere, but don't you think you should consider some cooler music? This soft jazz stuff reminds me of the dentist. I do like the name, though. Boot top? I dig boots. She lifted both her ankles so that Olivia could admire her lace-up stiletto-heeled leather footwear, but Olivia was distracted by the arrival of an unfamiliar middle-aged man. Two fingers of Glen Fittish. No ice, please, he told Gabe in a pleasant baritone. Malay noticed the newcomer in the mirror behind the bar and pivoted in her seat. What about you? She grinned flirtatiously. Do you like my boot tops? The stranger smiled at her but didn't take his lead his lead gray eyes his lead gray eyes from her face. I believe the boot top in this case refers to the russet line on the walls. Looking perplexed, Malay didn't respond. But Olivia locked eyes with the band and said, Are you familiar with nautical terms, Mr McNulty? Flynn McNulty flans Flynn stood in order to shake hands with Olivia. My knowledge of maritime matters is limited, but I believe that a boot top is the painted line just above the waterline of a seafaring vessel. Am I at least near the mark? You're spot on, Mr. McNulty. Olivia examined him from over the lid of her tumbler. Flynn assembled him, her simultaneously. Another whiskey drinker? He raised his glass in a salute. I may actually be able to live in this town after all. Malay snorted a noise that seemed incongruent with her beauty. It will take more booze to make Oyster Bay look good. Where did you live before? Just outside of Raleigh in Research Triangle Park area. In the Research Triangle Park area. I should know this. This is RTP. This is where, when I was in HR, we used to recruit all of our IT people. Anyways, I'm retiring from the cubicle land in order to open a bookshop here. It's what I've always wanted to do, and an aunt of mine was kind enough to leave me a small inheritance. I read about the town's building boom, and since the closed Barnes and Nobles over 50 miles, the closest Barnes and Nobles over 50 miles away, I figured this was as fine a place as any to risk it all. 
Olivia tried to ignore the quickening of her blood. A bookstore was her idea of paradise, but she preferred to, st to browse in other people's shops in place of opening one of her own. She turned to tell Camden the news, but saw that he was too engaged in flirting with the bartender to be diverted by anything she could say. Did you say something about books, Harris inquired, seeking to join their conversation? Shelves of them. I'm out tonight to celebrate. My shop? through the wardrobe, will open its doors this Saturday. I was planning on a hugely publicized grand opening in about two weeks, but my stock arrived sooner than expected, he shrugged. Now I'll just hang up some balloons and count on word of mouth advertising. Malay pulled a face. In this town, you'll get most of word of mouth than, you'll get more word of mouth than you can stand, believe me. It's so awesome that you named your place after a C.S. Lewis novel. Delighted, Harris finally tore his eyes from Malay's shapely legs and gave the newcomer his full attention. The two men launched into a discourse on the multifaceted subject matter tackled within the Chronicles of Narnia. Clearly displeased over being ignored in favor of C.S. Lewis, Malay poked Flynn in the fleshy part of his thigh. You might be stocking our book someday, you know. We're all writers. In that case, I'd better learn everyone's names, Flynn replied gallantly. By the time the assembly had consumed three rounds of drinks they were thoroughly convinced their fellow writers would completely devote themselves to their upcoming editorial respons responsibilities giving each of them the forward push needed to complete a scalable a saleable novel even olivia who thus far had only warmed to camden found herself believing that joining the writers group might be a step in the right direction toward becoming a social human being i'm feeling so inspired by this meeting laurel squealed excitedly as she bid everyone farewell but steve will be waiting up for me it's bad enough he had to babysit while i hung out at a posh restaurant drinking manhattans she hiccuped and quickly covered her mouth with her hands. I hope he lets me come to our next meeting at Olivia's cottage, she said from behind her palm. I'll have to detail his truck in exchange for being able to go out four nights in one month. Don't forget to take my chapter, Camden called after her and then stroked his smooth chin thoughtfully. Do you think she's serious about not being allowed to attend? Or having to detail her husband's car? Olivia glanced at Laurel's vacant stool and frowned. I'm greatly relieved to have no one telling me what to do. Uh, me too. I can't imagine having to do stuff just so I could leave the house, but... Then again, I am not married with kids, so maybe that's how it is. Uh, shortly following Laurel's departure, Flynn also left to the exuberant fellowship among the remaining writers seemed to deflate. Soon afterward, Harris and Malay drained the remains of their glasses and headed home, or in Malay's case, the beginning of her 9 to 2 o'clock shift at Fishnets. Camden kissed everyone on both cheeks, chiding them about being punctual and fulfilling their homework assignment by critiquing his chapter and then turned back to Olivia. I think things went well, don't you? And then before she could answer, good God, it's Blake Talbot. And hanging onto his ropey arm is his latest conquest, Heidi St. Clair. Oh, am I ever going to, am I ever at the right place at the right time? He rubbed his hands together with relish. Miss St. Clair is quite lovely in person, most unlike the freshly scrubbed, severely dressed character she plays on TV. She's only a girl, Olivia declared, really candid, and she can't be more than 16. Just 18. But this girl, this rising star from Iowa, is about to burst onto the Hollywood scene like a supernova. By this time next year, there'll be Heidi St. Clair dolls, a Heidi St. Clair clothing line, and a Heidi St. Clair fragrance. I am clairvoyant about these things. He wiggled his eyebrows. I saw the trailers for her upcoming movie releases. She's going to win armloads of awards for a role opposite Russell Crowe. Remember this conversation come Oscar night. Camden eyed the young woman discreetly, using the mirror behind the bar. Oh, Olivia, darling. They're here to have dinner. Can we please sit down at that little two-seater behind them? Can we have coffee and dessert? And can I eavesdrop to my heart's content? Please? Don't you know who... Don't they know who you are? Olivia asked as she nodded at the maitre d'. She gestured at the table behind the couple and allowed her suave employee to place a napkin on her lap with a flourish. Cameron perused the dessert menu. Of course they don't know me, whispered Blake Talbot. Like everyone in Hollywood and across our little blue planet believes that I am a woman named Milano Cruz, remember? Shall we partake of the chocolate creme brulee? Olivia only needed to raise her eyes and a waiter instantly appeared. She ordered Camden's dessert along with two decaffeinated cappuccinos. Now the trick, Camden whispered, is for us to pretend to be engaged in an important and intimate conversation. We lean in like so, and we move our lips every now and again, and we nod. Nodding's good. And then we listen to every word they say. Although she was skeptical of Camden's plan, Olivia was too interested too interested in discovering more about a member of the Talbot family to offer any dissent. As she concentrated on stirring cinnamon curls into her cappuccino, she overheard Heidi pleading with Blake. But I want this to be official. Her plate of tone was distinctly juvenile. If you come to my screening, then we'll all be in the magazines. We'll be in all the magazines. It'll make a huge statement. My mom and stepdad will see that you're serious about us. And of course, we'll sell a bunch of CDs just by being in people. Come on, Blakey, do this for me. Heidi, Blake spoke her name with an undercurrent of scorn. It's not like I haven't been in people before. Besides, I told you that I need to keep up appearances of being single. Girls don't want to listen to the tunes of some whipped loser. They like to dream, to hope they have a chance with me. I've got to stay a fantasy. Being your boyfriend doesn't fit in with the whole picture. Don't you get that? 
Heidi's disappointed sighs seemed to blow across the room. She raised a flute filled with the restaurant's finest champagne to her lips, but then placed it on the table again. It's not fair. Olivia could imagine her pursing her pretty lips, but I can't keep lying to my parents. You know how close my mom and I are. What if she calls Lila's house? And what if... Look, I'm going to meet with some people late tonight, and then tomorrow morning we're out of here. The Gulf Stream is all gassed up. We'll climb aboard, pop a bottle of mo, and... Blurk mercifully lowered his voice in an audible whisper, which was followed by a theatrical squeal from Heidi's side of the table. After one night in Vegas, we'll be back in L.A. You'll be home in time for dinner. Olivia leaned toward Camden, whose gaze was fixated on the painting behind her shoulder. He waved a spoonful of creme brulee in the air with his right hand. Delicious, he suddenly pronounced. He obviously doesn't care about her at all. Poor girl, Olivia murmured to Camden, shooting a sideways glance at the young man. She had to admit he was good-looking in a scruffy, rebellious sort of way. His black hair, dark eyes, and square jaws certainly lent him a masculine air, though he was far too reedy for Olivia's taste. However, she could see the other woman in the boot top were also ca casting covert looks in his direction, for there was a magnetism about Plague Talbot, a mixture of conceit and coarse beauty that most women found destructively fascinating. Camden was unsympathetic to Heidi's plate. He never cares about any of them. Deep down, they all know it too, but we all deceive ourselves, do we not? That we do, Olivia agreed, and you've got foam on your lip. Heidi continued her argument as Olivia and Camden fell silent again. Why can't I meet your friends? I don't want to be in that beach house all by myself at night. I came out here to be with you. Her pout was as extreme as a toddler's. These men are not the kind of people you're used to, Blake answered flatly, grabbing a bottle of champagne from the silver ice bucket in the center of the table. He filled his glass to the brim and then jammed the bottle back into the chilled bucket without offering to replenish his date's empty flute. You wouldn't fit in. Just because I play a minister's daughter on TV doesn't mean I am one. You have no idea what I've lived through. I haven't told you everything about my life. Olivia and Camden found Heidi's indignation amusing, and they both smiled and nodded as though one of them just received the punchline of a rousingly good joke. Well, you sure don't act like a choir girl between the sheets, Blake asked. Blake said huskily. If everyone knew how wild Miss Junior Idaho or Indiana or whatever redneck state you're really from, you'd be the cover on you'd be on the cover of all the magazines. Shut up, Heidi hissed. Oh, let's just go. I'm not hungry anymore. Oh, babe, Blake purred. I'm just messing with you. You know I think you're the most smoking hot chick in the whole world. Notice he didn't mention brains, Olivia commented. Camden smirked, or anything about her burgeoning talent. Unaware of the acute attention being paid to her, Heidi slipped her thin arms into a white silk cardigan and then folded the garment across her huge breasts, her high breasts. Then why won't you introduce me to the guys? The guys are not my bandmates, Heidi, Blake growled. They're not my posse. They're a bunch of ex-con fishermen and knife carrying scumbags who'll do anything for a buck. Got it? Then why are you hanging out with that sort? Heidi asked, and Olivia was pleased on behalf of her gender that the young woman had finally exhibited a hint of intelligence. Let's just say I'm making an investment in my future. Blake waved his hand in the air, rudely signaling for the check. That's the end of the subject, Heidi. We're going. Well, I just hope you're not buying drugs, Heidi said with a sulk. I don't approve of them. And besides, there's plenty of those back home. Right, like you're such an expert on the subject, Blake, was openly der derisive. You're, or is it derisive? Whatever. <laughs> you know what I meant. Uh, you're not the one who has to rock your ass in front of thousands of people. You get to sit around between takes, getting manicures and drinking mocha soy lattes. No matter how much pressure I'm under, I'll never take drugs, Heidi whispered as she stood. So I hope that's not what your big secret meeting at that gross bar is all about. If rumors about drugs or anything illegal affect my reputation, I'd be kicked off the show and my marketing value would go way downhill. I'm supposed to be a role model. Don't you care about my future? I have two films debuting this summer. Blake grabbed her roughly by the arm and propelled her past Olivia and Camden's table. It's not drugs, babe, so get off your high horse. It's something much more dangerous than that, he muttered darkly. And since I've got to protect your precious rep, I won't tell you anything else except that my plan is going to make me a shitload of money. Camden stared after them, a greedy gleam in his eyes. I wonder what Barry could be referencing. If Heidi thinks it's gross and fishermen hang out there, then there's one likely choice. Blake is conducting his illicit business at Fishnets, the establishment where Malay works. Olivia, my dear, we're after we're done with our dessert, how would you like to? Not a chance, Olivia cut him off. Later this evening, after we're done, I will be in my lovely house, clad in a pair of silk pajamas, cocktail in hand, watching Masterpiece Theater. I can confess to having enjoyed myself tonight, but I have no intention of spending a single minute in a foul-smelling bar filled with men whose cologne is a mixture of smoke, sweat, and fish, or with women whose clothes are neither three sizes, whether three sizes too small or veritably see-through. Nothing you say will convince me to change my mind. She placed her empty mug into its saucer, saucer and with a firm click, with a firm clink. I will never set foot in that disgusting place. Never say never, Camden said with an expressive wink. Olivia felt an inexplicable, inexplicable tinge of anxiety as she headed into the kitchen to collect her thoroughly gorged poodle. 
So are you still here? <laughs> that is finally the end of chapter two. So the good news is you are like already partially done with this book. I don't even know how many chapters are there. I don't know how many chapters there are. I don't know why. For some reason, the paperback version doesn't tell you the total number of chapters, but the online Kindle version does. But either way, you can see you're done with a good portion. I would say it's like probably like one tenth of the book um, done at this point. Anyways, there's a lot of cursing in there. I've never heard cursing in cozy books. I guess you could put them in cozy mysteries. You can do anything you want. But um, yeah, so I like this chapter much better. It's getting more interesting. And I am excited to read the rest of it, even though I still don't like any of the characters at all. <laughs> so, uh, but it seems to have like a very interesting setting and plot. So we'll see all right make sure to join the cozy escape book club we have a newsletter that goes on in the 15th of every month and we will be meeting at not the end of november we usually do the last wednesday of every month to talk about the book but because the last wednesday is the day before thanksgiving we have moved it up a week so we will actually be meeting on wednesday november 20th and if you like hanging out with us and you are a writer like the characters in this book Courtney and I will be doing write-ins November 6th and 13th. So we'll be doing live streams for that. So all fun times to hang out with us basically every Wednesday in November except the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So hope to see you at one of those. And I hope everyone is having a fabulous Sunday and that I didn't put you to sleep with reading my chapters because I know, I don't know if I sound, I just don't have that melodious voice yet. I'm working on it. So maybe by this time next year, I will have improved my read aloud skills. All right. I will see you guys later. Bye.